Again, thank you for listening to the broadcast of the Brooklyn Baptist Church Northeast. At Brooklyn, we have two campuses, one in West Columbia at 1066 Sunset Boulevard, Highway 378, and in the Northeast area at 1203 Summit Parkway. On behalf of our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Charles B. Jackson Sr., and the entire Brooklyn Baptist Church family, I am the Reverend Chris Levy Johnson, and we wish you a great day and a blessed week in the Lord. disciples, wine, which represented his shed blood. And after celebrating the feast of the Passover, after telling him that he had to leave them, he said these immortal and immortalized words that found in the gospel according to John verses chapter 14 verses 1 through 6 words that most of us know by heart let not your heart be troubled for you believe in God believe also in me for in my father's house are many mansions and if it were not so I would not have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself. And whether I go, ye know, and the way, ye know. Well, Thomas said unto him, How can we know the way if we don't even know where you're going? That's the Chris Levy Johnson translation. And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Chapter 14, verse 1, begins with those words, Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. I want to talk about heart trouble. On this last Sunday and the last month of this year, I want to talk about heart trouble. As our resident physician makes his timely entrance like he knew what my subject was. Ready for a stress test. Heart trouble. Heart disease is the number one cause of death in the United States of America. More people 
die from some heart-related disease, than cancer, than HIV, than a stroke, pneumonia, than any other medical issue. Every year, approximately 900,000 persons die from some issue of the heart. And every year, about 700,000 persons have a first or second heart attack. I said more people die from heart trouble than any other issue in the United States of America. As we all know, African Americans lead in the number of persons who have some cardiovascular medical issue. Because of our diet, because of our history, and Lord knows because of our stress. 40% of the 300,000 African Americans who die every year die from a heart attack. And 45% of the entire African American community, the entire African American community, have some form of cardiovascular disease, heart trouble. And I'm sure that each one of us in here this morning knows someone who suffers from some form of heart trouble, whether they have had a heart attack, whether they've had a blockage, whether they have had a splint placed in, Michael Keels is very cold in here. And it's going to lead to heart trouble. <laughs> we all know people who have routine visits to the doctor's office. We all know people who have to have annual stress tests. We all know people who the doctor have recommended exercise at least 30 minutes a day. But the majority of us, pastor included, spend three hours on the couch or in the TV watching bed. We all know people who have heart trouble. But pastor, this is not the heart trouble that Jesus is talking about in John chapter 14. This heart trouble, Dr. Parker, that he is talking about cannot be diagnosed in your office. This type of heart trouble cannot show up on an EKG. This type of heart trouble cannot be shown on a stress test. This heart trouble does not have any medicine that can ooze and move its malady. This type of heart trouble comes from the anguish of mismatched expectations. I said again, this, this, this heart trouble comes from the anguish of mismatched expectations. For in the gospel according to John, the disciples expected Jesus to remain around a little bit longer. But Jesus expected to die. I wish somebody would pray with me. The anguish of mismatched expectations. And I'm sure that along life's journey, you've had some mismatched expectations. In chapter 13, Jesus and his disciples again celebrate the Passover meal in that upper room on a dead-end street. They gather together in the annual celebration of the Passover. That is commenced in Exodus chapter 12. For in Exodus chapter 12, Moses is told to tell each child or each male and the children of Israel to take a pure lamb and kill it and then make unleavened bread, which is bread without yeast, and take the blood of the lamb and save it and paint that blood over the doorpost of your homes. 
because I'm going to send the death angel in to kill every firstborn child. And when the angel sees the blood on your doorpost, that angel will pass over your house and your kindred will be spared. And Moses was obedient to God and did just what he said. And each head of household took a lamb and killed the lamb and took that blood and painted it over the doorpost. And that night, under the cover of darkness, the death angel came through and killed every firstborn child in Egypt. And as the country mourned, and as the country had tears in their eyes, they could not see the children of Israel leave. Led by locusts and covered by the night sky. That next night, those Israelites took the lamb that was left and the unleavened bread and crossed over and through the Red Sea. They found themselves in the wilderness of Sinai. And one year after their escape, they paused to celebrate the feast of the Passover. And to remind themselves what God had done for their kindred right. and their people. Right. They paused not only to celebrate their freedom, but they paused to celebrate their faith. They paused to say, thank you for sparing us and thank you for saving us. And they commemorated that evening by the rest of the lamb and the unleavened bread. God gave them unleavened bread, which is nothing but crackers. It is unleavened again because there is no yeast. And because there is no yeast, the cracker cannot go bad. The cracker might stale, but the cracker does not go bad to the point that you ever have to throw out crackers. I wish I had a praying church with me. Uh, it will go stale but it will not have to ever be thrown out because it will not grow mold. Right. And on life's journey, there are some things in your life that might go stale. Yeah. Uh, your marriage might grow stale. Uh, your relationships might go stale. Your, your finances might go stale. Your, your job might go stale, but, but there's enough to keep you from starving. Uh, yeah. uh, there's some things that will be able to maintain you. Yeah. Help me hold the ghost. While you're walking through your wilderness. And so, in chapter 13, they're celebrating the Passover. But what is interesting, Ron, in John, after celebrating the Passover, unlike the three synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus does not clear off the table and bring out dessert and coffee. He does not bring out the bread and the wine. But in John chapter 13, the Bible says that he takes off his outer robe, gets down on his knees, and begins to wash the disciples' feet. He does not again bring out this bread and this wine, but he begins to wash feet. Because John is not concerned about the sacraments of the bread and the wine. John is concerned about service. I said he's not concerned about the bread and the wine, but he's more concerned about the bread and the wine, what they mean. And they mean sacrificial service. But you got to understand in this time in Palestine, the shoe of the day, Cheryl, was not Gucci. It was not Dolce and Gabbana, Mama. It was sandals. And everyone who wore sandals, naturally your feet got dirty. And that's why at the home of everybody's house, there was a basin of water and a towel at the front door. So that before you went into the house, you would wash off your feet. So you would not track dirt and dust into that home. Can I get a witness? And that's why Jesus takes the towel and the water and washes the disciples' feet 
feet uh, to let us know that every now and then uh, our flesh has got to be washed uh, both spiritually and physically and what the bread and the wine represent uh, is the washing of our flesh uh, for all last month uh, your flesh got a little dirty all last month uh, your flesh got a little dirty and a little dusty and we come to this table uh, for God to wash us Say they represent sacrifice and service. And after he washes their feet, he tells them, now one of you is about to betray me. One of you who dippeth in the dish is about to betray me. And I don't know about you, but have you ever been betrayed? Have you ever had a friend stab you in the back? Have you ever had a friend whose life you helped save and whose shirt you gave off the back of your back who turned around and left you? That will cause heart trouble. Have you ever thought you had a friend and that friend turned out no longer to be friendly? That will lead to heart trouble. And then Peter says, well, if you're going, I want to go with you. And Jesus says, you cannot go with me right now, Peter. Matter of fact, Peter, even before I go, you're going to deny me three times. Uh, uh, you're going to be left lonely, not understanding what's going on. Uh, but let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Hold up, Eli, I'll be there in a minute. Let me mash these potatoes a little while. Amen. Every now and then, the Lord Jesus Christ says some things that do not make sense. Every now and then, he says some things even in his word that initially sound crazy. He tells them he's about to leave. They don't know where he's going. They have already feel sad. But he then says, don't be upset. <laughs> this is the same man far who told them stop fishing, but then makes them serve fish and hush puppies to 5,000 men, women, and children. This is the same man that will heal you and then go tell somebody, don't tell nobody, I hear you. This is the same man that says in this life you will have, be, have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Every now and then, Jesus says some things that don't make sense. And as their heart is broken, he says, let not your heart be troubled. What you mean, man? We left everything, left our job, left our family. We thought we were coming in to take over. That's right. We had already decided what positions we going to have in the cabinet. I'm going to be Secretary of State. Judas going to be Secretary of the Treasury. We already got our positions. And what you talking about? You leaving us. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Let a conditional term that says you can either let it happen or you don't have to let it happen. Either you can mourn forever or you don't have to let your heart be troubled. And I would declare unto you that the word let might be the most powerful word in the Bible. But when the Bible and the world was out form and did not have any light and there was darkness God said let there be light and the sun marched its way into the center of the solar system and the moon pranced her way into the night so there would be a night glow when the world was without form or shape he said let and planets and constellations moved into their rightful lanes into the universe so that there has never been a traffic jam in heaven. He said let, and a wet back showed up in heaven. And that wet back sucked out all the water so that the earth showed up. He said let, 
and grass began to grow like carpet in a new home. He said let, and that grass was tacked down by trees, shrubs. He said let, and a daisy began to smile. He said let, and a carnation began to bloom. He said let, and a rose had dew on the morning. I wish I had a witness up in here. He said let, and dogs began to bark, and cows began to moo, and hyenas began to laugh, and horses began to trample on a thousand steeds. He said, let it, and fish began to swim, and birds began to fly. He said, let us, and that means that all three of them got together, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and he made man in his own image. I said, he said, let, and that man became a living being. He said, let, and that man stood up and gave God the glory for everything he had created before him. I said, he said, let. And every now and then, uh, you need to go into your child's room, uh, lay your hands on your child, uh, and say, let you make good grades, uh, let you be obedient, uh, and let you be a good person, uh, and let you go to class, uh, and let you get off that computer, uh, and let you get off that Xbox, uh, and let you stop texting, uh, let you go to bed on time, uh, let you wake up on time, uh, let you stop talking back to me, say, let, let. <laughs> Sit on down. Yes, sir. Let, let. So when he says let, let will lead to creation and adoration. Let will lead to creation and adoration. That's why David says, let everything that have breath. Praise the Lord. Let, let everything that woke up this morning praise the Lord. And that's why he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. But then he says something else that's crazy. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. How can a mansion... fit in a house for a mansion is much larger than a house and Jesus says that in his father's house are many mansions that ain't possible Jesus crazy but what he is saying to us is that his father is the mansion and we are the house. Our house is the tabernacle or, uh, or the place where the imago dei, which is the image of God, resides. And Jesus is telling people that when your heart gets troubled, uh, put something that is larger than you inside of you. Because my father is much larger than you are. And give your small problems uh, to my large father. That, 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 that God is bigger than your problem. God is bigger than your circumstance. God is bigger than your mistakes. And if you just let God inside of your little house, he will blot out and crowd out your heart trouble. Huh? If you let the big man in, he will let the little stuff go. Help me, Holy Ghost. Uh, help me, Holy Ghost. Uh, I wish I had a witness in here that understand he's much bigger than you and your issues. He's much bigger than your problem if you would let him handle it. He will work it out. In my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would not have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And so my brothers and my sisters, as we come to this supper, on the last Sunday in this year, tell you let not your heart be troubled I don't know what problems and heart issues you've had over this year but I know you've had a few they might be big to you or small to others but if you're over the age of 18 and maybe under the age of 18 you've had some heart problems and you've had some heart issues Again, I don't know what your problems have been. 
But since I've got the mic, <laughs> let me testify. Yeah. I want to let you know that I approached 2014 with much trepidation and fear. I said I approached 2014 with much fear and trepidation. For on July the 16th of this year, I turned 40. That leads to a midlife crisis. They can tell you all you want to that 40 is the new, or 50 is the new 40. But I turned 40 on July 16th. 40 is so old that they put up billboards about it. Oh, Lord, guess who's 40? And I knew that when you turn 40, half of your life was over. Things start changing in your body. My hair was already falling out. Have to have glasses to see. I wake up early now to do some biological things now that I had to do before. And I also knew that at your 40th anniversary physical, some ungodly things happened to me. <laughs> So I didn't want to turn 40. But I declare unto you that besides that physical, 40 and this year 2014 have been a great year. I don't have time enough to tell you all the great things that have happened this year. Many of my closest friends know because I call them all the time and let them know what God has just done. But it's been a great year. I've seen some things, done some things, made more money thanks to my daddy than I've ever made. Ain't he all right? I said, ain't he all right? And I want to declare unto you that this year has been a great year. But, I said but, on October the 12th of this year, I said, October the 12th of this year, I found myself in the emergency room of Providence Northeast. For two weeks, I was having anxiety attacks and stress beyond measure. For two weeks, I couldn't sleep. Every time I tried to sleep, I felt like my heart was beating in my throat. I couldn't understand it, Ron, because ain't nothing really I knew was bothering me or stressing me out. There was nothing I could think about to be causing the stress. But the back of my neck was tight, and my chest felt like an elephant was on top of it. Till that Sunday afternoon, I tried to take a nap. And I could not sleep because my heart was hurting. And then I began to feel pain underneath my armpit. Well, I, he don't mind me telling you, but my daddy had a heart attack when he was 32. And heart problems and heart disease run in my family. So I knew I couldn't put off going to the doctor any longer. But as a matter of fact, I, I couldn't make an appointment. I needed help right then and there. And I told Cynthia I was going to the CVS mini clinic on Hardscrabble Road to at least let them check my blood pressure. Well, when I looked Boutte at the sign, it was about 6 o'clock. And the mini clinic closes at 5.30. But I went in anyway. And thank God the door to the mini clinic was still cracked open. And I saw the nurse sitting there. And I tell you, God will always leave a door cracked open. And before I could enter the door, the nurse said, hey, Reverend Levy, I attend your church. I tell you, he is the God that goes before and I told her what I was feeling. And I said, I know you're closed, 
but will you take my blood pressure? And she said, sure, sit down. And she took my blood pressure. And it was 160 over 90. And that was very, very high for me. And I told her about the pain underneath my arm. And she said, you need to go to the emergency room at once. I said, not Providence Northeast, because you'll wait there till Jesus come. And she said, just tell them you're having chest pains and you will get back as soon as possible. So I drove myself from Hard Scrabble Road to Providence Northeast Hospital. I went up to the desk and the man said, hey, Reverend Levy, how you doing? I said, man, I ain't got time for small talk, but I've got some chest pains. He said, sign your name and come on back. And they put me in a private room, not one of them things where they slide the curtains and everybody can see your business. They put me in a private room and the, the doctor came in and he took me my blood pressure and he hooked me up to the EKG. They took an x-ray of my chest. They gave me Tylenol or aspirin and nitroglycerin uh, to make sure I was not having a heart attack. Uh, and after a few minutes, uh, they came back and told me everything is negative. Uh, you did not have a heart attack, uh, but we need to keep you for four more hours uh, to make sure that your potassium levels stay regulated. Uh, I said, what you mean? Uh, the Cowboys play the Seahawks at eight o'clock? Uh, I ain't got four more hours. Uh, he said, well, you got to stay to make sure that everything and your vital signs stay normal. Uh, I said, well, I ain't got no choice. Uh, but while I'm complaining about not being able to see my cowboys, uh, another angel walked by. I don't know her name, but she attends the west side. And she says, hey, Reverend Levy, how you doing? Do you need something to eat? I said, hallelujah. There is a God uh, somewhere. And she... <laughs> And the lady brought me something to eat and said, do you need anything else? And I said, yes, I need one more thing. You see, my cowboys play in 15 minutes, but my iPhone has gone dead. Can you find me a charger for the iPhone 6 with the lightning cord? Can I get a witness? And 10 minutes later, coach, she came back not only with a regular iPhone cord, but the longest iPhone cord I've ever seen in my life that went from the wall all the way to my bed. I called my wife and said, baby, I'm all right, but I'm going to watch the Cowboys beat up the Seahawks right here in Providence, Northeast. Can I get a witness? I wish I had a praying church with me right now. Well, I was dozing in and out of sleep. I said I was dozing in and out of sleep. And one time I woke up and I noticed that there was a hole in the wall. And I noticed that there was a stopper behind the door, but there was still a hole in the wall. From every time they'd open up the door, that the door beat into the wall. And I'm trying to wonder how could there be a hole in the wall if there's a stopper on the door. And the Lord spoke to me and said, in life, you can try to stop some things. But a long life journey, you're going to get some holes and you're going to get some bruises. And the Lord reminded me that he was bruised. <laughs> for our transgressions <laughs> he was wounded <laughs> for our iniquities <laughs> and the chastisement of his peace uh, was upon us <laughs> and by his stripes <laughs> we are healed <laughs> say yeah I said, say yes. And one time I woke up, Dr. Parker, all I could see was red. Can I get a witness? And I guess it was the bag that they put all the contaminated blood in. Say yes. And I thought to myself, I want to thank God right now for the blood. For nothing contaminates you more than sin. But be even washed by the blood of the Lamb. Say yes. But I must have dozed off really, really bad because I woke up. And only thing I could see was white. And I said, oh, God, I done died. Because everybody say they done died and came back. They say they see white because they think they're in heaven. But it ain't the white of heaven. It's them big lights over top of you in the hospital. But after realizing that I was still alive, I thank the Lord for being alive. But by sealing from color purple, I had to say, I'm still here. I said, I'm still here. Anybody besides me? You might not have been in Providence, Northeast, but by the providence of God, you're still here. I said, you're still here. I don't know what issues you've had this year, but anybody want to thank the Lord? I said, anybody want to thank the Lord? Anybody want to give God praise that you're still here? Say yes! Yeah.
if you're still here, that everything that have breath in your body, praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. The fact that you're still here, 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 I'm here. Thank you. I said, thank you that I'm still here. Well, 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 well. Let me tell you how the story ends. Stay where you are. Stay where you are. After they let me go, they said, we still recommend you get a stress test. We will make an appointment for your stress test. Well, I didn't say nothing. Because our good friend Myron Bell is a cardiologist. And I called Myron that Monday morning and said, I need an appointment for a stress test. And he said, we'll bring you in tomorrow. Expect a call from my nurse. That quick. But you got to have good friends. I went to the heart center, the hospital, and they hooked me again to that EKG and put me on that treadmill. And I killed it. <laughs> You've been on one, you know that thing keep going up and keep getting faster. And I went for about 12, 13 minutes, and they were shocked that a man my size could go that fast for that long. <laughs> I said, ain't nothing wrong with me. And Myron came in and smiled and said, ain't nothing wrong with you, man. Amen. But because of your history, let me see you next year. Well, Thursday morning, after receiving some very bad news, and you can verify with my secretary, I got a call from the Columbia Heart Center asking me that I have an appointment that afternoon. And I'm thinking to myself, you should know if you got the computer. She said, do you have an appointment this afternoon? I said, no, I do not have an appointment with you. I've already seen Dr. Bell, and I've already passed the test. I said, I've already passed the test. I said, I've already passed the test. I said, I've already passed the test. I don't know what you're dealing with right now in your life. I don't know what issue you've had or are having. But I just came by to declare unto you yes, yes. that during this season, Hallelujah. if you're still here like Sealy, yes. you've already passed the, passed the test. <laughs>